You're watching Clinical Nutrition University, and in this video, I'm going to cover six strategies that you can use to help patients who are dealing with a loss of appetite. Let's pretend for a moment that you're a registered dietitian working in the acute care setting. You're assigned to an oncology unit, and you receive a consult to assist in the management of a 56-year-old male who was recently diagnosed with stage 2 lung cancer. The patient has no chewing or swallowing difficulties, no gastrointestinal issues, and is safely eating by mouth. However, he reports persistent anorexia for the past 6 weeks, which has resulted in an unintentional weight loss of 23 pounds. You visit the patient at the bedside, and he says he understands the importance of eating, but is finding he can no longer bring himself to eat his usual three meals per day. He wants to know what steps he can make to improve his ability to eat. What's your response? While there are a number of strategies to improve appetite that you can recommend, before you introduce any, I think it's helpful to lead with two disclaimers. First, the patient should know that no single intervention is likely to solve the anorexia. Second, the patient should know that no single intervention works for every patient. By doing this, you bring awareness to an unfortunate reality. An immediate improvement cannot be guaranteed, and there will need to be a period of trial and error to find out what works, what doesn't work, and what else can be tried. From there, there are six strategies that I think you should consider. The first strategy I'd like to recommend is to aim for small frequent eating sessions. This can be anywhere from 5 to 8 eating sessions per day. When it's less than 5, it can be difficult for the patient to eat a large enough portion size at each session to meet their total daily energy needs. When it's above 8, the sessions start to get stacked way too close to each other. For instance, if the patient is aiming for 8 sessions per day and starts at 7 a.m., they would have to eat every 2 hours all the way up until 9 p.m. Squeezing the sessions closer together or expecting the patient to extend the feeding window to 16 hours or more simply isn't feasible. The main reason I find small frequent sessions work for patients with anorexia is that larger meals can be overwhelming. Even if the patient comes to the table feeling like they're ready to eat, once a full tray of food ends up in front of them, they may lose their willingness to eat just from the thought of having to eat all of it. By placing a small portion size in front of them, they're able to approach the meal with the positive mindset that they can eat everything. If they do eat everything and they're hungry for more, they can always be served more in the same session. Aiming for small meals doesn't mean the patient should avoid taking advantage of periods of hunger. The second strategy I like to recommend to patients with anorexia is to schedule eating times. So, not only should they plan to eat 5 to 8 times per day, but they should also establish structure by identifying the exact times they'll eat. Patients are best served by having their eating sessions spaced evenly throughout their waking hours, with individual adjustments made to account for factors like the time they go to bed, wake up, and take naps, their work or school schedule, and any regular health appointments or therapies. Without having set times to eat, patients with anorexia can go much of the day without eating. Then they find themselves entering the late afternoon or evening with only one to two sessions completed and no realistic way to fit the rest in. Creating a schedule decreases the likelihood that this happens. I've also found that eating at regular times day after day and week after week encourages the body to anticipate food at or around the same time each day. This way, even if the patient doesn't feel hungry in the morning, if they're diligent about eating even a small amount, the body will eventually begin to crave it. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you check out the companion piece for it. You can download that for free by clicking the link for it in the video description. The third strategy I like to recommend to patients with anorexia is to enhance the eating environment. 
To do this, patients can be encouraged to do the following activities during their eating sessions. Socialize with others in person or on the phone, scroll through social media, watch television, read a book, newspaper, or magazine, listen to music, or place comforting objects on the table like flowers or a photograph. This happens to be the exact opposite of what I recommend to patients who are trying to lose weight. That's because when people are distracted or entertained, they tend to graze without realizing how much food is actually being consumed. The activities or objects that are introduced should promote feelings of happiness, relief, and satisfaction instead of sadness and stress. Otherwise, they may have the opposite of the intended effect. Patients should also avoid becoming overly distracted by the activity, especially one that requires the use of the hands or speaking at length, as it may detract from the primary objective, which is eating. The fourth strategy I like to recommend to patients with anorexia is to identify problem smells, tastes, textures, and temperatures. Patients with anorexia frequently develop sensitivities to these factors, which can be directly related to foods and beverages, or they can be environmental like the smell of a cleaning product or the temperature of the room. These changes may result from their disease process, a treatment or medication they receive, or as a condition response to past experiences. For example, if a patient used to love pizza, but then vomited after eating it, the mere sight or smell of pizza can make them feel like they have to vomit again. The factors that are problematic will ultimately differ from patient to patient, so each patient or caregiver should keep a detailed written account of any that come up, and they should be avoided as much as possible. Generally speaking, patients with anorexia who also experience nausea and vomiting seem to do best with bland, cold foods since they're usually less odorous. Patients with anorexia who also experience a bitter or metallic taste in their mouth may need to use gum or mints before an eating session and explore different herbs and spices with their food. The fifth recommendation I like to give to patients with anorexia is to choose foods that are easy to chew and swallow. This is because a high amount of oral processing promotes satiety. In other words, the more a patient needs to chew and manipulate the food with each bite, the faster it will make them feel full. Thus, if not being able to eat enough food is the issue, then you don't want the patient to have to do a lot of chewing and manipulation. Desirable food choices include scrambled eggs, tuna salad, yogurt, pudding, cottage cheese, ice cream, mashed potatoes, oatmeal, guacamole, and banana. High calorie beverages like smoothies and protein shakes are desirable too. Less desirable choices include raw vegetables, apples, dried fruit, nuts and seeds, tough pieces of beef, poultry, and pork, thick and chewy bread, chips, and pretzels, and sticky and gummy candy. That brings us to the sixth and final recommendation, which is to avoid drinking fluids during the eating sessions. This is recommended because fluids occupy space in the stomach, and therefore contribute to feelings of fullness. The last thing I want to happen to my patients with anorexia is for them to drink a large glass of water before or during a meal, and then not have the appetite to consume much else. Obviously, exceptions can be made if the beverage is a high-calorie smoothie or protein shake. If the patient is dealing with dry mouth, they can have small sips or rinse their mouth with liquid in between bites to make eating easier. Outside of these circumstances, drinking should mostly occur between eating sessions, not directly before or during them. Other recommendations I've seen include engaging in exercise before an eating session and taking an appetite-stimulating medication. Exercise didn't make my list of recommendations because I find that more times than not it will actually lead to an acute suppression of appetite. 
This is particularly true for patients with anorexia who are weak, since even a short walk can be exhausting for them. Appetite-stimulating medication didn't make my list, because the totality of evidence on them suggests they're minimally effective at improving appetite and outcomes. I have a video on this topic, which you can watch by clicking the link at the top right corner of your screen. In summary, when providing guidance to patients with anorexia, I suggest they 1. Aim for small, frequent eating sessions. 2. Schedule eating times. 3. Enhance the eating environment. 4. Identify problem smells, tastes, textures, and temperatures. 5. Choose foods that are easy to chew and swallow. And 6. Avoid drinking fluids during eating sessions. There's no need to apply all of these strategies at once. Many patients benefit from adding one or two at a time to see how they affect their ability to eat, and then making an informed decision on how to proceed. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to download the free companion piece for this video by following the link in the video description.